Larson. I'm the director of the Montana Embry. And the Montana Embry is the organization that really started these Cafe Scientifiques in, in uh, Bozeman. And the Embry program is uh, funded by a grant from the National Institutes of Health. It's a grant that has the purpose of developing research infrastructure, biomedical research infrastructure uh, across Montana. We also have some other partners tonight. The uh, Center for Zonatic Disease Research, which is in the Department of Microbiology and Immunology at uh, MSU, which is another uh, NIH grant to support research in zoonotic diseases. And finally, the Thermobiology Institute uh, tonight is a partner, and uh, our speaker is the director of that institute, and I'm sure you'll be hearing more about that uh, later on tonight. Uh, a couple of other things, we'll have another Cafe Scientifique April 10th here, and the speaker that night is Emily Grassley, and she is the Chief Curiosity Correspondent at the Field Museum in Chicago and uh, creator of the Brain Scoop uh, on YouTube. And Emily will speak on uh, From Art to Science, a New Perspective on Communication. And uh, so that's April 10th here, same time. And there's also a sign-up sheet uh, out in the entryway. If you're not on our uh, email list, and uh, if you sign up, then you'll be notified of the uh, future Cafe Scientifiques. Okay. Now, the cafe, for those of you that haven't been here before to a cafe, we uh, have speakers who really talk about uh, their subject for somewhere around a half hour, 20 minutes to a half hour. And then we'll take another break. You'll have a chance to uh, fill up your glasses again and, and maybe your plates, and then maybe about a 10 minute break, and then we'll come back and that'll be your chance to ask questions of our speaker. And we'll go on, you know, maybe for another half hour, and, uh, and then we'll be finished. So, with that, I'd like to introduce our speaker, Dr. Brent Payton. And Dr. Payton is Professor of Chemical and uh, Biological Engineering at MSU, and also the Director of the Thermobiology Institute. He's a well-known bioengineer, especially in uh, uh, renewable bioengineering and uh, environmental restoration. He has more than 95 scientific publications and has had funding from uh, agencies such as the National Science Foundation, Department of Energy, State of Montana, and private industry. He was a 2011 uh, recipient of the Wiley Award here at MSU, which is for meritorious research. And he's going to tell us about, uh, the title of his talk is The Unknown Yellowstone. Microbial discoveries and biotech applications. So, thanks a lot, Brett, for coming. And see if I can do this without dropping everything. So, I can't believe how many people are here. This is great. Thank you very much. Um, I wanted to start out with a picture of the Yellowstone that most people um, recognize. You know, the, the elk and the buffalo, bison, um, and some hot springs that you know, Old Faithful. But I also want to tell you guys about some of the other parts of Yellowstone that most people don't really ever think about or see when they're there. Um, and this is the microorganisms that are living in the hot springs. If you look at this picture, even, you can see, you know, the water splashing up. That's probably the first thing you notice. But if you look around in the pool, you can see the different colors. And those are typically associated with microorganisms that are growing in that extremely hot water in the springs. So Yellowstone formed from huge volcanic eruptions. Um, I don't know how many of you have been to Pompeii where you, know, you see the buildings that were covered, they were covered in about 10 feet of ash. Um, if you took the last eruption from Yellowstone, it was about 640,000 years ago, and uh, took that, about 600 cubic miles of material came out of the uh, caldera, that eruption. 
If you think about that, that is um, enough material to cover the entire state of Montana, 21 feet deep. It's an amazing amount of material. What's left today is, after all that came out from that eruption, um, we've got hot springs all over the place. Um, it may be a little difficult to see in this picture, but um, there's hot springs essentially. It, this purple line is the caldera. It's about 40 miles across in the long direction and about 25 in the short direction. Um, and there's hot springs. All these little red and yellow and orange dots are, are hot springs scattered throughout the park. There's about 14,000 different hot springs, different thermal features in Yellowstone. Um, we have 55% of the world's hot springs right in our backyard. So over half of them are within a few hours of, of uh, Bozeman. The thing that intrigues me, and I'll keep coming back to this point, is that less than 1% of these have ever been sampled for what organisms live in them. So we've got 14,000 sampled, maybe, you know, 100, 150, some in the, somewhere in that range. Um, and we've got 13,000 hot springs out there that nobody even knows what's in there. Yeah. <laughs> so Yellowstone's changed quite a bit. Um, so some of you may remember the little bears, you know, pawing at the windows. Um, today, basically, it's study the bears in their natural habitat. Keep them, you know, not away from people, but um, just let them be natural. And the same kind of thing for hot springs. You know, a lot of people think Yellowstone, the bells and whistles, the eruptions, the geysers, the bubbling pots and whatnot. Um, at TBI, we think of these hot springs essentially as unique environments for life. And so, if you look, just look at this simple picture of one uh, thermal feature, you've got some organisms living in this very low pH water, it's acidic um, organisms living here. This little spring right next to it is a different environment and there's totally different organisms. Some of them may be the same, but totally different organisms, just inches away. Um, you can see some photosynthetic organisms living on the, uh, the rocks nearby that get this steam that comes off. And so every different location in here could be a new habitat for new organisms. And so you think about the diversity in one spring, and then there's 14,000 of these, and we've looked at a few. And these are just kind of pictures of um, some of the different organisms there. We've got bacteria, we've got archaea, which are um, other microorganisms that are presumed to be more, much more ancient, um, fungi, and then e each of these organisms has probably three to 10 or 20 viruses that then attack those. And so in, in each of these hot springs, there's multiple layers of, of life photosynthetic organisms, archaea, bacteria that live in these um, hot springs. So what are thermophiles? That's going to be the main um, focus of my talk. Thermophiles are organisms that thrive at very high temperatures. And so um, you know, what is, what's a high temperature? These guys live sometimes above the boiling point of water. If you can keep water from boiling, keep a little pressure on it, organisms can live all the way up to so far People have found them 113 degrees centigrade. Um, we think of thermophiles as anything above about 50 degrees centigrade. And to put that in perspective, if you go home tonight, turn your hot water tap on, full blast, let it run until it gets about as hot as it's going to get, that's probably in the 50 to 60 degree temperature range, depend <coughs> depending on what you have your thermostat set at. And so that's that's the low end of thermophiles. There's some thermophiles that wouldn't even grow in your hot water because it's too cold. Okay, and so these guys are very adapted to live in these extremely high temperatures. They also can tolerate other extreme conditions like lots of toxic metals. They've adapted ways to um, survive and detoxify their environment, to uh, survive in toxic metal solutions. It's been joked that Yellowstone um, be, partly because of the mercury, but partly because of the arsenic and whatnot, would be a, um, 
an EPA hazardous waste site if it wasn't a national park. <laughs> Um, these organisms have adapted to live in these acidic, alkaline, and toxic metal conditions. So, why study these things? I mean, it's, you know, it's interesting and whatnot. Um, but, but to give you, I've got a bunch of reasons here, and I'm going to expand on those, but um, why study the microorganisms that live in these hot springs? And, and first of all, just to, from a fundamental knowledge perspective, just trying to understand the biodiversity on Earth. You know, we know about elk and we know about wolverines and whatnot, but there's organisms that uh, we've never grown in a laboratory. Nobody's ever managed to characterize these organisms, and it's not just a few. Um, the hot springs are considered models for life on early Earth. So back when there were volcanoes everywhere, um, a lot of people use hot springs as uh, models for where life may have originated or how organisms started to, to grow in the first place. Um, extreme organisms help us look for life on other planets. And so if you think about, um, you know, we think of lakes and streams and those are kind of typical conditions for living organisms. But if you start to go away from that, say high temperatures or high salt or acids, um, you start to find things that are living in places that you would never have imagined. And some of these conditions are the same as conditions that um, astronomers are predicting for moons of Jupiter and for other, other planets and places using these extreme uh, environments on Earth and finding out how life survives in those is a good model for um, astrobiology, trying to understand if there is life on other planets, where would it survive and how would it survive. This is the one that gives me less than a thousand, and I think that thousand is, is still too small, less than a thousand, uh, less than one in a thousand organisms that, that we see have ever been grown in a laboratory. And so you think about all the biotechnology that we have, pharmaceuticals and um, all the DNA replication and renewable energy and whatnot, all that's based on less than 1% of the organisms that are out there. It means 99% of biotechnology is still unknown, uncharacterized, never been grown in a lab. And as a, a bioengineer, as a scientist, to me that's fascinating because there's so much still left to do in this area. And to me, Yellowstone really captures the unknown aspects of that. Um, so we've done some studies down in the Heart Lake Geyser Basin, and I'll take you on a little tour there here in a few minutes. But um, when we pull DNA out of these, we take small samples, analyze the DNA, Half of the organisms that we see the DNA sequences for are so different that we can't even start to name them. We don't even know what genus to put them in. So they're so different. They've never been observed anywhere. So we're still trying to figure out how to, uh, we don't even know what to call them. They're just so different. So trying to grow those and characterize them is uh, just a whole new ball of wax for us. Um, this is another one I like. With that much unknown diversity out there, um, it's extremely interesting for um, students. I mean, students have a real possibility to go on one of our sampling trips, collect some samples from these hot springs, and culture grow something in the laboratory that nobody has ever grown before, ever, in the history of anything. Um, and so, it's a great way to get kids interested in science. To just say, you know, let's go, let's go on a hike. We'll do some samples. We'll uh, grow something nobody's ever seen before, and they they love that. And then um, I think all, again, all this biotechnology potential out there is a lot of potential for um, improving society, and adding. And I'll give you some examples of discoveries from Yellowstone that some of them have been made in the past and some from our labs as well. Um, so it's a number of different reasons to, to keep doing this research and I'm sure there's more. Okay, so Heart Lake Geyser Basin. 
Um, most people never make it back to here because it's from where this picture is taken is about five miles from the road, and most people don't get that far from the road in Yellowstone. Um, it's one of the reasons that that we chose it as an area to study because it really hadn't been looked at at all. It's also got one of the highest densities of uh, alkaline hot springs in the park, and so those two characteristics make this an interesting area, a different area to study. Essentially, it's got a number of <coughs> thermal sites. So there's one here you can't see. This is a, the dome, another thermal area here, and then Rustic Geyser Basin back there. You can see Hart Lake in the distance, and Hart Lake is just south of Yellowstone Lake, which is right over that hill there. Um, so we've got about a two-mile stretch of a Geyser Basin that essentially, when we're back there sampling, we may see one or two people a day walk by on the trail. Um, but it's pretty remote and uh, pretty inaccessible. <coughs> so this is one of my favorite areas in that Heart Lake Geyser Basin. It's actually one of my favorite pictures, and I've got it up on my wall now, thanks to Heather. Um, and just when you look in this picture, you can see there's a very large dome back here. It's got some uh, thermal springs right up top that then run down the sides. And the temperature changes, the pH changes as, as these little streams equilibrate with the atmosphere. <coughs> it's got Witch Creek that drains through the bottom here. This is a high temperature, high pH creek. It's about 9.8. And at this point, it's about 55 degrees C. So not your, it's hotter than your hot tub and colder than your hot water tap. Um, and it's got a lot of photosynthetic organisms in there that I'll, I'll talk about in a few minutes. There's a spring back here that drains down the side. Um, that this, we've actually got organisms that can break down um, lignocellulose for renewable materials. It's got another little thermal feature here and one there, and then a spring here that um, I'll talk about at the very end that it's 92 degrees C and it's pH 9.8 to 10. And so far, we have never gotten anything. Oh. It's just maybe it's too extreme. We don't know. It's a challenge. <laughs> to put the size in perspective, um, it's a pretty big, pretty big feature. Um, we've never, you know, obviously we don't want to destroy anything or, and safety is always an issue. We've never walked up onto any of that. We try to stay on the grass because we know that if it's grassy, we can. Um, there's not a chance to cave in and fall into hot water underneath, which some of uh, some researchers have. Thankfully, not from uh, MSU. Uh, it can be very dangerous to break through the crust while you're trying to sample. You can see barely in this picture. Maybe in the back you can't see, but we use. Um, long uh, window washing poles with, with cups and stuff attached to the end so that we can stay back as far from the hot springs as possible while we're sampling. So we can sterilize the cups and then reach in and take a little scoop of, of water when we're trying to sample these, these hot springs. Okay. So we've done everything from day trips Again, there's a couple of grad students and undergrad student. This is Witch Creek here. Um, everything from day trips. It's kind of a long day trip. It's two hours down to the trailhead, five miles in. Um, you got about an hour and a half to two hours of sampling before you have to turn around and get out so that you're not there um, hiking out after dark. So it gets a little, um, gets a little hectic and tiring. Don't worry, that happens to me all the time in class. Um, but also, we've done trips where we um, have got a, an outfitter, and we take horses in, and we've taken all of our camping gear and all of our scientific gear. So we're eight miles from the road, and we've got tents and sleeping bags, but we've also got spectrophotometers and coolers full of dry ice and um, you know, test tubes and all sorts of scientific stuff out there. For, for analyzing the composition of the springs, what's the 
And what's the chemical composition? What's the metals content? What's the, um, how many organisms there are per, per milliliter of water? So we can do all that in the field. Um, we don't take canoes in, but I left this picture in because um, it leads me to an interesting story. On this trip in 2007, we're there on the 2nd of July. <clears throat> A lot of people probably don't know, but Heart Lake is closed. That area is closed from March until July 1st because of bears. Um, and so we decided to go in on the 2nd. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're back there. The first morning, everybody sit, all six of us are sitting there having coffee. And um, one of the guys walks off to the latrine. And about 30 seconds later, it's like, hey, guys, there's a bear coming. And so the five of us that are by the fire, um, we have our coffee in one hand and our bear spray in the other. And lo and behold, this grizzly bear just walks right past us about 25, 30 yards. It seemed closer than that, but we paced it off later. <laughs> <laughs> um, nobody had a camera. Well, one guy had a camera, but he was shaking so much and he was out of focus. Um, but the bear just kept going. There were five of us. He never even looked at us, thankfully. Um, he kept going and went two campsites down where the people had left a little bit earlier than we were getting out of camp that morning and um, clawed into their tent, chewed up their sleeping bags. And uh, we didn't know this. We, were, we had left to go sampling. But basically, that evening, the ranger comes to our camp and says, we're evacuating everybody. This whole place is getting shut down. You guys got to go. We're like, we've got 600 pounds of camping gear, and the outfitter with the horses is not coming back until Thursday. Right? And it's like Monday night. Um, so anyway, we finally talked the rangers into letting us um, bring all of our scientific gear, all of our camping gear. It took us three trips with two canoes across the lake to get everything back to the ranger cabin. And then the ranger let us stay camped right outside the ranger cabin while everybody else had to leave. So we didn't have to abandon our scientific <coughs> study, but um, everybody else in the whole basin had to leave. And so we, we stayed and played cards with the rangers and had a good time. Um, so anyway, that's why, that's why there's canoes in this picture. We've seen quite a few bears back there, but never had any issues, thankfully. <clears throat> so as far as the biotechnology, um, to study these organisms, they've got some unique properties. And one of the first ones that I want to tell you about is uh, uh, what's an organism called Thermus aquaticus. And it was found in Yellowstone and basically led to the biotechnology revolution. Um, if anybody's ever watched CSI, you know, where they find a hair and they extract the DNA and multiply it up and, and then track down who did it. That's based on an enzyme that this thermophile, Thermus aquaticus, produces. Essentially, it's a DNA photocopier, for lack of a better word. It multiplies copies of DNA, keeps amplifying it until you can measure it and get a sequence and figure out what organism or who did it or what organism you've got. Um, essentially leading to things like the Human Genome Project. <coughs> Nowadays, every biological lab uses TAC polymerase in their uh, PCR machines. We teach PCR to undergrads. It's just, it's so uh, commonplace and that it's one of the huge discoveries um, from Yellowstone. We can talk about you know, benefit sharing and whatnot. Yellowstone, I don't think got any funding at all based on the, <coughs> the results of that. They've changed some of their policies. Now we have to um, fill out a, a research permit, so every sample that we take, every place that we study is, is pre-approved by park personnel, make sure that we're collecting responsibly, that they know what we're doing, um, we take as small a samples as possible. Uh, it's very well, very well organized and very well controlled. The next slide is um, pictures of bean sprouts. And if you can't read it from the back, essentially the temperature goes up from left to right in both cases. And the bean sprouts on the left that are dead are just plain old bean sprouts at 38 degrees C up to 50 degrees C. The ones on the right <clears throat> were treated with a fungus 
that was found in Yellowstone that was from a um, plant called panic grass that lives right next to the hot springs. And this fungus gave panic grass the ability to survive at very high temperatures. And when you take that fungus and put it on even seeds, it gives those seeds the ability to survive high temperatures. It gives the, the plants, not the seeds, the plants the ability. And it also gives them the ability to be more resistant to drought. And so think through, you know, what are the implications of that? This is something that if you put on seeds, you could make them more drought resistant. And with um, climate change and places in third world countries where you know, maybe surviving a heat stroke or a, a, a drought means the difference between living through the season and not, this is the kind of technology that thermophiles can potentially uh, provide. And so this is being licensed um, out to, uh, through a company. It turns out, I've just seen a recent paper, a fairly recent paper, that it looks like it may not even be the fungus that does, provides that protection. It may be a virus that the fungus has that provides that protection. And so, you know, just kind of layer upon layer of these thermal organisms that people just keep finding that provide these kinds of, of uh, abilities. Here's some stuff uh, from my lab. Um, I don't know if you can tell what this is. Uh, it's ground up pine trees, wood chips, um, corn cobs. So what, what does this have to do with thermophiles? Any thoughts? Ha, it's not question time yet. <laughs> um, so these, the US produces about a billion tons of lignocellulose every year that could be converted into renewable fuels and chemicals. There's a huge reserve of this material that essentially we still don't have the knowledge and the technology to convert this into useful materials um, profitably, to, to break even. So we've got organisms, we found organisms in the um, Heart Lake Geyser Basin that can, can, that can grow on these materials directly. You essentially, you put these, put corn stover into the test tube, add the organisms, and few nutrients. Uh, they can grow at um, pH, what is it, 9, 9.5 and, and up to 70 degrees C, which facilitates the breakdown of this material, makes, it able, makes those organisms able to grow, and then we're starting to look at ways to um, produce useful fuels and chemicals from the organisms that grow on these materials. How about this guy down here? These are diatoms. Um, diatoms are, they're called algae, but really when you look at the, the DNA structure of diatoms, they're actually um, more closely related to animals than plants. So they've, they've got some, some mouse genes of all things. Um, so basically they're little photosynthetic animals uh, that live in glass shells. The, the outside here is silica. They make their own shells out of silica. So photosynthetic animals that live in glass. Um, pretty amazing little creatures. These come from, the, uh, from Witch Creek. And the reason we're looking at these is, um, you can't really tell. This is a, a, a light <coughs> microscope image. And um, what we do with these organisms, we're looking for the ability to produce biofuels. Photosynthetic production of lipids of oils for biodiesel, for um, renewable fuels. And the way that we start looking is look at them under a microscope. We stain them with a dye that turns bright yellow if it's in oil. So I want to show you the, the stained version of this picture. These guys have so much oil in them, we can't see anything like these. We can't see anything that's not stained bright yellow and full of oil. Some of these organisms have 70% oil by weight inside the little glass shells. Um, some of them, when we grow them in the lab, they get so full of oil that they burst. They, they can't seem to stop making it. <clears throat> so we're, we're studying these. We're, um, we just got the entire genome sequence, so we're trying to figure out all of its metabolic capabilities. We're trying to... Um, understand how to make this organism grow faster. 
we can't, we don't really expect to be able to make it make more oil because it already makes so much that the shells pop open. Um, but we're trying to figure out how to make it grow faster using sunlight and CO2 from the atmosphere to produce lipids that are then pretty easily converted into biodiesel. Um, we've got a patent on the, we've started adding, um, some of you may have seen, we've done a number of press releases on it, adding um, baking soda at just the right time. It's sodium bicarbonate. They need extra carbon, CO2, and, and at these high pHs, we add sodium bicarbonate, and they rapidly increase their uh, oil production. So we figured out a way to, to multiply their oil rates by about four times. We get them to, to make lipids about four times faster uh, with the addition of baking soda than without. Um, and we've gotten some funding from the makers of Arm & Hammer baking soda to <laughs> continue to do this research. So it's, it's really kind of cool to, to pull all that together. Um, so a lot of this work has been funded by the federal government. Um, some, I don't know how many of you have read the paper, but basically the Congress has been squabbling a bit and with the sequestration and whatnot. Funding's been a little more difficult to find. Um, so we've been going out to private industry, we're writing proposals constantly, we're also working with the MSU Alumni Foundation to um, get funding to take students out. And so we've got students who, like Chachi, who uh, basically had never been camping before, she's from mainland China, uh, and never been camping before, came on one of these sampling trips with us, so she's eight miles back in the wilderness um, for multi-day trips. This is Matthew Fields, uh, world-renowned um, microbiologist. And for students having the chance to have lunch by a geyser eight miles from the road with an uh, you know, internationally known microbiologist talking microbiology um, next to hot springs is uh, pretty amazing. We also do a lot of outreach to the middle schools. so. We do art projects depicting microorganisms, depicting hot springs. Um, we've done quite a bit of work in the park with kids where you know, we, uh, it's Mark Young telling students about hot springs and microorganisms that live in there. We do a lot of uh, hands-on lab work in the schools. Um, a lot of happy kids there on the boardwalk. We also um, have a book that we are um, raffling off tonight. We've got four copies, so if you put your name in the bowl on the way in, um, it's called Living Colors, and essentially it's a, uh, a very small field guide to microorganisms, and it's trying to identify microorganisms in various springs. We've got a, a color wheel here. Mm -hmm. Essentially, you go to a spring, you figure out what spring you're at by the color there, and then turn the wheel till you find the same color as the microorganisms, and it gives you an idea of what the pH and the temperature and what the probable microorganisms are that, that you're seeing. So it's, it's, a, you know, it's, it's not like a, people want to do an app for this. <laughs> <laughs> I kind of like the color wheel. <laughs> so anyway, it just gives you a little bit of an idea, a little bit more insight maybe into what the organisms that you're seeing in that particular spring. Um, and so if you want to, we're giving away four of those, plus the um, Atlas to Yellowstone and some coffee. Throw your name in the thing. <coughs> we'll, we'll pull names at the intermission. And then finally, I want my last <coughs> one. I want to leave you with, um, this is that spring I was telling you about, that uh, 92 degrees, pH 10. It just happened, we didn't put that skull there. Um, it just happened to be there, so it made a good, good picture. Um, this spring we have never, we've tried numerous times, we've sampled it, we've never been able to get any DNA, we've never been able to culture any microorganisms out of it. I've seen things that look like microorganisms under the microscope, but never got anything to grow. So it's, it's sort of a personal challenge to uh, keep going back and figure out, we want to do, um, do some more sampling, do some concentrated, uh, try to concentrate some of the organisms, see if we can find something in this particular stream, spring because it's, again, so extreme. I think it's probably right on the edge of what life can be.
and survive. With that, I want to, um, one last thing. We do have a, a small uh, a website, a Facebook page called Extreme Biology. If you type Extreme Biology in Facebook, there's three Extreme Biology. Make sure you go to the MSU one because there's a couple of others that aren't as good as ours. <laughs> um, we also have a very nice website, TBI Montana. And if you want to have any questions after the question and answer session, feel free to give me an email. I'd be happy to, to chat with you more. Um, and I want to thank the, the sponsors as well, and thank you guys all for coming. Okay, uh, so like I said before, now is your chance to uh, ask questions of our speaker and remind Brent maybe to uh, repeat the questions so the people in the back can hear. And I was also requested that you hold the microphone a little closer. <laughs> Okay. Hold on. Before the questions, we're going to do, we've got a few um, of the color wheels to give away along with the Allison Atlas. So if you put your name in the bowl, um, we want to, uh, go ahead and pull a name. Diana Vanek. Diana Vanek. So the question is, um, we've gotten some federal funding, we're also getting some private funding, and what do we owe the companies after, the, um, after they pay for some of that research? So basically, um, we, I'll use the example of the adding the sodium bicarbonate for the um, increasing the biofuel production. We figured that out, we wrote a patent um, disclosure, but MSU doesn't have the funding to pay for patents, right? So every patent that MSU actually files is paid for by some other private entity, industry, or someone who wants to invest in that. Um, and so basically the uh, company that makes Arnold Hammer Baking Soda paid for the patent, they would um, uh, get to, assuming that that turns into something commercial, I've got five patents and never made a nickel on any of them. Um, but assuming that turns into something commercial, then they would have a uh, first right to negotiate with MSU on the use of that patent and then MSU would negotiate what the royalties were uh, for that. Typically, um, you know, the, the inventors get some fraction, it's maybe 50% of the royalties. Um, MSU gets some of that and the company would the main reason that they're interested is to sell more sodium bicarbonate. Mm -hmm. so, yeah. I'm curious, where does the park come in? Uh, so the park comes in. Any funding? For yeah. So the question is, where does the park come in in this? And I neglected that in, in your talk. Right, in your question. Um, essentially, as part of the permit process, we agree to to what's called benefit sharing with the park, and so the park makes. Um, keeps track of the organisms that came from the park. So if we, if we take that diatom and we want to share it with a company or another university, we have to fill out what's called a material transfer agreement. 
so that the park knows exactly who we gave that organism to, and what they're going to use it for. If anybody ever makes any money on that, the park gets about 10% of the, the overall profit that comes from uh, some commercial application. Um, and so it's part of that came from the um, tax preliminaries where uh, the park didn't get any of the profits from that and essentially they learned that it's, that it's possible to, if they manage it correctly, to reap some of the benefits of the diversity and they to pretty much plow that money back into the management and the, the management of the resources. So I, I think it's a great system. I think they, that any money that we can get back to the park is, is money well spent. When you, okay, you go out and do the thermal feature and collect and come back to the lab, what's your uh, regimen for going through a sequence of initial tests to figure out potential uses of these organisms? There's some properties, there's an infinite number of things you could discover. How do you begin? Okay, so the question is, um, what do we do when we go into the park and we pull a sample and we bring it back to the lab, how do we What's the regimen that we go through, and what's the um, how do we know what we're looking for, and what what to do? There's an infinite possibilities of what you can do with these samples. Um, we pretty much go in on a sampling trip with a with a purpose, and so for example, one one trip may be to find organisms that can live on um, wood chips and and degrade wood chips and make um, glucose or make some sort of sugars help break down wood chips. And so we would go in, find springs that are very high temperature and high pH, and then um, either uh, take wood chips in with us in test tubes and fill the, fill the water right up from the spring. A lot of times if we're trying to grow the organisms later, we would take in, we have a whole collection of thermoses that we use that we would fill the thermoses up, get them nice and warm, take them back to the lab, keep them warm all the way back to Bozeman so that those organisms aren't ever and exposed to too much cold temperatures. If we're just looking for DNA, we'll carry in a cooler full of um, dry ice, and as soon as we pull the sample, we put it on the dry ice and flash freeze the DNA as soon as possible so that um, there's no changes in the relative concentrations of the organisms and the DNA. So it really depends on what we're looking for. For the, the diatoms, we, again, we bring those back alive in thermoses. We um, see which ones we can grow in the laboratory, and then we test them with that Nile red stain, and the ones that turn bright yellow, then we try to see how fast they grow and how much lipid they produce. So it really depends. There's so many possibilities that we kind of go in for one particular purpose each time over the years. Been pretty much not every year, but almost every year since 2005. Are there medical applications that you anticipate may come? Um, I, so the question is, are there medical applications that we would anticipate coming from this? There's a number of um, uh, DNA replicating uh, enzymes that people are still looking at as far as medical applications. One of the we've had a company um, Lucigen that uh, has come in with us because they're, we were doing the pack trip in anyway. They needed to um, uh, do some fil carry some filtering materials. And they've got a, um, a process, I forget what, the acronym is LAMP, but basically they are um, looking at a way to amplify DNA that uh, doesn't require the high temperature and the low temperature temperature cycling, and so they've got some uh, uh, polymerases that have come from the thermophiles that essentially the, the, the thought behind that is that you could do this in any sort of um, warm water bath, so you can you could do DNA application for detection of diseases, say, in um, hot water in a third world country, so you could use it as a, a medical detection um, system. So it's very specific to each disease, but you don't have to have a lot of expensive equipment. So there, there are definitely still some medical applications out there. I'm not much of a medical, I'm more environmental. 
and so I don't do as much uh, medical work. You, you mentioned that uh, you found no organism that could So the question is, um, what's the highest pH we found um, that has life in it? And some common examples of these high pH uh, uh, analogs. And I think I've got a slide, but I, I won't go to that. Um, so this one, pH 9.8 to 10 and 92 degrees, we haven't found anything. We do have um, some springs that are the same temperature and a more uh, pH 9 to 9.5 that we have got no organisms that can degrade the uh, wood chips. So at lower temperature, it's the combination of high temperature and high pH. At, at lower temperatures, you can get organisms that grow almost up to say 12, 11 to, to 12, um, but the combination of high temperature and high pH seems to be especially difficult. Um, let's see. It's a good chemistry question. Um, I, <laughs> milk of magnesia. Oven cleaner, I think. Oven cleaner. I don't know the pH of oven, oven cleaner. cleaner. Anybody know the pH yeah. of oven cleaner? I think oven cleaner is around 10. Okay. Um, milk of magnesia, I think, is in the 9 to 10 range. Um, people don't really think of alkaline things as much as, as acids. I know a lot of the, the acids, but. Uh, yeah, basically Tums, those kinds of sodium bicarbonate is pretty near tan. Lye, yeah. Question in the back? When you're trying to regrow the bacteria you find, so you're mimicking the environment, what other type of media are you using to regrow Um basically we try to look at what their nutritional requirements might be, so temperature and pH is the first thing. But then we also, everything pretty much needs some sources of nitrogen, some sources of um, carbon and phosphorus, and so we try to make media that have those particular, we add nitrate or ammonia, we add um, carbon, we add all sorts of different things. You know, people have tried growing organisms on everything from sugar to, um, we've done pine needle extracts, um, growing them on wood chips, the solid materials, um, a bunch of different organic acids. So the carbon sources, really a lot of different choices for that. Um, use amino acids for nitrogen sources. Uh, so we just, we tried a little bit of everything. One of the approaches that in the proposals that we're working on now is to go in and do more DNA sequencing and protein sequencing, figure out what uh, what the organism's machinery is before we even try to grow it and use that information to feed back into learning about how to grow it better. And so we're using these techniques that don't even require any culturing. It's just pull a sample, extract the DNA, sequence it, figure out all the different gene functions, and then try to use that to predict how these organisms might be surviving. So, and then go in and grow some of these that nobody's ever grown before. So that's, that's our current proposal strategy. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. So as you're building up a, a list of different archaea that um, have these traits, are you, are you starting to see a pattern of um, key genetic uh, uh, markers that, that now exist in, in higher life forms? Uh, I mean, if you started, you know, I, earlier you mentioned something about the mouse, because some of in the mouse key, but are you starting to catalog some of the things in this archaea that has passed through the eons into, uh, into multiple life forms? The, that's, so the question is, are we starting to, um, from some of this DNA sequencing, are we starting to catalog um, genes and capabilities in these archaea that may apply to higher life forms? So far, we haven't done that work. So we've essentially looked at the one, the one gene, the 16S gene, that 
is used commonly to categorize what genus, what species these organisms are. The next round of work that we're hoping to do would then be to sequence all of the DNA from a particular spring. So we would know what genes it has to uh, convert ammonia, what genes it has to uptake iron, those kinds of things. And then we can start to answer the, those kinds of questions. How close are we in industry or whoever getting to making uh, a genetic sequence of the cost effective? Good question. So the question is how close are we to making algal biofuels cost effective? Um, right now, I, I would estimate that we could produce a gallon of biodiesel for about $20. Um, not many people are going to pay twenty dollars, even though it's totally, you know, comes from atmospheric CO two. It's like the greenest fuel you'll, you'll ever get. Um, but just human nature, we're not going to pay twenty dollars for that. Um, there's techniques now that are being developed at places like the Pacific Northwest National Lab called hy hydrothermal liquefaction, and essentially it's a process that can convert any sort of biomass to uh, fuels. And so that looks like it's going to significantly decrease the conversion costs for taking biomass uh, like algae into fuel production. So, you know, like with us, we got a factor of four by adding a little bit of sodium bicarbonate. And you know, we keep adding a few factors of four and some factors of two, and, and eventually I think the price will come down to something that's, that's useful. And maybe, you know, who knows, maybe once we stop fracking quite so much and prices of uh, gasoline go back up. Not that I'm wishing that on us, but yeah. Other questions? Yeah. This is for her. Okay. Um, <laughs> she, she wanted to know if the park, because they only get 10% if they have a say-so who comes in the park to take. Um, these samples out or not? So the question is, does and what the, they're used for? And what the samples are used for? What the, if that was the product that did develop from the samples, the commercial product, would the park have anything to say about what it, what it was used for? If it was um, so the question is, if something commercially is developed, does the park have a, a say-so on who gets to come in and sample? And then if something is developed, um, does the park have a say on what is produced? The first part, definitely. The park has a process where you write up a proposal. You tell them what samples you want to take and where and why. You also have to get that peer reviewed by two other scientists <coughs> to um, make sure that it's scientifically sound, that, the, that you have a good reason to, to pull these samples from the park. Um, and then that goes and gets reviewed by a panel at the park that then questions, do you need, you know, do you need 50 mils of sample, can you get by with 10? Do you need four scoops of this sand, or can you get by with two? And so they ask every, you know, pretty much everything. Um, once you pass through that, they give you the permit, and then every year you say exactly what samples you pulled, exactly where, who was in the park with you, and it's very detailed records of who gets to go in. So not just not just anybody can go in and, and start pulling samples out of hot springs, which is good. Um, as far as what's being produced afterwards, um, I've never, maybe I haven't read the contract as carefully as I should have, but <laughs> I've never seen where they said, you know, this, you, you cannot do this, and you can do that. Uh, but most of the stuff that we've worked on has been focused on renewable fuels, renewable chemicals, beneficial uses of, of the microorganisms. And again, we've met, never made a nickel, so we never had to negotiate with the park to, uh, <laughs> for benefit sharing. We, do, we pretty much just publish everything. And, uh, but I don't know. I, I'd have to go back and look at, at the contract and see if they have the right to say, no, you absolutely can't, can't do this. Good question. And that? What, uh, what sort of diversity are you seeing between different pools? You know, I meant to mention that. Um, I had a, in my other talk with the, where I had data, I um, meant to mention that. We see um, in, in uh, some of the samples that we pull out, 
the, the question, and I should repeat the question, the question is what sort of diversity are we seeing in the springs, in the samples, um, and, and I'm interpreting that to be how many different organisms do we see, say, in a, in a particular sample. So we may pull a teaspoon of material out of the hot springs, extract the DNA, um, and we may find anywhere from 200 to 1,000 different organisms, different species of organisms in that uh, teaspoon of material. And I guess in addition to that, between the different pools as well. Sort of right, and that's where I was headed. So in different pools, so one teaspoon, you move to the other side of the spring, and you're going to get a different number of, different set of organisms. And you go to the pool right next to it, which is maybe uh, 90, 90 degrees instead of 85 wow. degrees, and you get a whole different set of organisms. You may get, and typically what we see is the higher the temperature, um, the fewer organisms are there. The, you know, it really selects down to the hardy few. And down at 44 degrees, some of the lower temperatures, which we didn't, I didn't mention, but um, we have maybe a thousand different organisms in a gram of, of soil or sediment. And then up at the higher temperatures, we may have 200 different organisms. So it really starts to limit down to who can survive. Are these the same organisms? And they're totally different organisms. Totally, yeah, totally different. So when you go back to the lab, you're multiplying these things, but uh, have you been approached on gene splicing and things like this if a commercial entity wanted to um, combine some of these? So the question areas? is, we bring them back to the lab and we, we grow these organisms. <laughs> have we been approached by commercial entities to look at um, gene splicing, genetically modif genetic modification, I'm assuming, mm -hmm. um, of these organisms? Um, I personally am not a big fan of GMOs. Um, a lot of the stuff that, uh, so I don't, I don't do that. But a lot of the things that we're looking at are more larger scale applications. So, for example, the growing the diatoms to make biofuels. We're going to need ponds that are half a mile square, maybe, you know, to make enough fuel to make it worthwhile. I don't think anybody, maybe somebody in this room, wants a half a square mile pond of a genetically modified diatom next to their house, but I don't. Most people don't. And so, um, I think I like to look at nature, the evolution over millions of years. I think these organisms are out there that can do a lot of the things that we want them to do that have evolved to do that naturally without splicing in pathways. And I think you know, there's a lot of industrial application for that, especially for very high value products. It's in a small volume, high value, but as an engineer I mostly focus on larger things and, and I don't think GMOs are going to be um, cost effective and I don't think they're going to be socially accepted at those scales. Question in the back. So with the diversity you were talking about earlier, is there a lot of overlap between <coughs> the spring or pool, pool or is it completely different? So the question is, is there a lot of overlap from spring to spring or pool to pool? Um, what I would say is if you have very similar conditions, say the same pH, the same temperature, um, similar sunlight conditions, then then you'll get a lot of similarities. But but just slight differences in temperature, slight differences in the, the water chemistry can totally change which organism dominates. The one thing that you will see is that there's various niches. There's you know, certain organisms that do certain things with nitrogen, and there's certain organisms that consume carbon with oxygen. And there's somebody that will fill that metabolic niche, but it may be a different organism that does it. Question over here? So the question is, are there applications of um, bioremediation to metal contaminated sites? Yes, the short answer is yes, and um, we're working on uh, separate projects, not thermophile related, but separate projects using microorganisms to precipitate selenium, to keep selenium from getting into rivers and streams and whatnot, because basically there's organisms that can I'm going to use the word breathe, but it's kind of the same way we use oxygen. They can use selenium, chromium, uh, uranium. And we've worked with all of those. And essentially, they can take those materials um, 
reduce those the same way we reduce oxygen. And when, they, when those metals get reduced, they become insoluble and they precipitate out. And so the idea is to use microorganisms as sort of a filter. The water moves through, the microorganisms precipitate out the chromium or the uranium or the selenium. The water keeps going and now you've got the, the heavy metals trapped in a place you want it and you can either dig it up or make sure it doesn't leave. So yes, absolutely. But most of the sites that we've looked at for that are not high temperature. They're normal groundwater. Time for one more question. Oh, is that all? Yeah. <laughs> um, how about two? Well, one in the back. Okay. Are there similar kinds of sites that So the question is, are there similar studies to what we're doing in other thermal features of the Earth? And yes, there are. There's some hot springs down in Nevada that folks um, in that area are working on. There's uh, quite a bit of studies over in Kamchatka where there's a, a sort of similar hot springs. Um, so yes, there, there are. What we've seen is that there's a lot of, um, there's significant geographic differences in the, in the organisms I mean, there, there's some similarities, but there are also some significant differences in the organisms from one hot springs region and another hot springs region. And you can imagine, I mean, the scenario is that you get a volcanic explosion, it blows a lot of thermophiles up into the atmosphere, and that circulates around for a number of years and falls in, say, the hot springs in Kamchatka. So there's organisms there that then they start to adapt and evolve to slightly different conditions. And over a number of years, millions of years maybe, they become different species and have different capabilities. OK, last question. Uh, this is a dual question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> next, next to the last question. Anyway, so deeply involved in this, I mean, these organisms are archaeas, they're ancient organisms, and they have adapted to this extraordinary extreme environment, which probably is consistent with the early bird environment. And I, and I wonder what your, what your thoughts are about the evolution of life when you look at these organisms. And the second thing is what the implications are for astrobiology or other plants or organisms. Okay, so the question, two-part question. Um, what are my thoughts on the evolution of these archaea and, and you know, early life and, and what we see today? And then what are the implications for astrobiology and life on other planets? Um, first of all, I think, you know, we talk about organisms being ancient, you know, ancient, but essentially they're the organisms that we see today and we can track back using genetic um, and I don't do this personally, but researchers here at TBI do. You can track back and look at small changes in the genetics and basically come back to organisms that are um, common ancestors of you know, no, numerous organisms above them, for example, that have a certain trait that seems to have carried through in this, what's called a tree of life. Um, however, there's a lot of data that shows a lot of genes genes can be transferred horizontally from one organism to another and so people have started kind of calling it the shrubby bush of life. <laughs> so things are transferring horizontally as well as, as vertically and um, it's difficult, I, I think it's difficult to put a, put a clock on that. And so for the most part I think the evolutionary studies are very interesting but um, trying to absolutely say this many changes in this DNA sequence represents you know, 10,000 years, I think is, personally, I wouldn't, I wouldn't make those. Um, and then, as far as the um, astrobiology, I think, you know, you look at, again, you look at the, the extreme differences in where organisms can live, and I, I usually have a slide that shows the range of extremophiles, and so it's got a little tiny red circle where, say, the Madison River is, and then um, outside of that, you would have very high temperatures. Organisms survive all the way up to above the boiling point. Organisms that survive all the way down to um, below the freezing point, they have temperature uh, optima down near freezing. Other organisms that 
that their maximum growth rate is at pH 1, and others that their maximum growth rate is pH 9, 10. And then some you pull up from the deep sea, and they are typically growing under 400 atmospheres of pressure, and you pull them up to the surface, and their enzymes are so floppy that they can't, uh, can't even function up here in the atmosphere. They need that high pressure to survive. And to me, it just, you, know, you can pick any of those and then start looking on other planets and say, you know, there's a possibility that something could survive under those con conditions. And then to finish, the last thing, one of the ways that we preserve organisms is we take them, we dry them out, and freeze them, desiccate them and freeze them, and they'll stay alive for years. And if you think about organisms getting blasted into space by some kind of asteroid hit or whatever, that's exactly what happens. They get tossed up into the atmosphere, they leave the atmosphere, instantly frozen and desiccated. They may last for years on a piece of space dust and fly around. And so I think there's a huge possibility for, for those kinds of things. Okay,